We're back. We're live. We're the two o'clock rock show on Tuesday. <laughs> right. Here we guess are. what? John Whitehay, former governor of the state of Hawaii, joins us today. We are so happy. We are honored to have you here. That's sir. what happens when we walk past the same hallways, right. you know. <laughs> Jay, when are you going to have me on your show? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming down, Governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Thank let's you. talk about you. Uh, gee, I, you know, I mean, maybe maybe somebody out there hasn't met you yet. <laughs> You know, oh, really? Is there such a person? <laughs> Actually, it's, there is a generational gap. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If you are the certain age group and the, you see me as high you know, and then when they're really young, two things happen. Either you talk to my grandma or who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think you ought to be able to walk down here the street or something? Do they ever confuse you with your son? You know, constantly. Constantly. <laughs> and um, I don't like being blamed for what Oha does. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's, yeah, we, we do. We do run into the situation where people think that I'm the Oha trustee and people think that he did whatever I was uh, accused of. So, you know, All it's a burden. Family. It's a burden growing up as the, as the children of, uh, you sure. know, people who are in politics. Sure. And it's, it's tough on them. Yeah. Well, but on the other hand, you know, everybody knows the name. <laughs> Almost everybody. <laughs> well, that was what the wonderful thing was. You know, when I ran for office, uh, the, 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 the precinct that gave me the highest numbers of votes was actually Waihe'e Valley on Maui. <laughs> And they, there was a, they actually knew how to say my name, too, which is kind of interesting. You know? <laughs> they thought you were from there. Something. Yeah, well, they thought I must have been somewhat connected. You yeah. know? But and, you're not from I, Maui. No, I'm not. I grew up in the Big Island, but my grandfather yeah. was actually from that valley. Yeah. So I, I never, I don't know whether we were named after the place or, or uh, the place was named after some ancestor. You That's know? great. I, I, I don't know, but it's... Uh, yeah. No, I'm a Big Island boy. Yeah. yeah. Where part of the Big Island? Well, I grew up in Ahuloa, in Honoka, Waimea, that area, yeah. right in the beginning of yeah. Uh, yeah. West Hawaii, you know. And it was a wonderful time and a great place to live. You it know? was. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, in fact, I was just up there uh, in Waimea. And it's a little crowded now, a little bit more crowded than I, when we were there, but it's still a wonderful place to live. Yeah, open you know, spaces. Man, yeah, and graze your kids. Yeah. You know, it's got that good community feel where, um, you know, it, it's the kind of community that's working and, and that if you're in government like I was, you should just leave alone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't go there. Don't go fix the, it. You know, yeah. Don't go mess it up. You know. But you know, it reminds me, that I don't know why I make free association, but Larry Mayhow lives there. Yes, Did you yes, know yeah. Him? We yeah. Well, it's interesting group? because, as you know, Larry, Larry passed Died, away. Yeah, and, uh, you know, um, when I was growing up, see, Larry came as a Hawaiian homesteader, and we were already there. So he came with this new bunch of people, and we used to call them... Uh, and uh, the Honolulu people. <laughs> these, these are these Hawaiians <laughs> moving in from Honolulu. And he was, uh, but he, he was bigger than life. You know, he was bigger than life. I was a youngster. And I remember one incident, which is uh, just to underscore the human dynamic of living in the same community. We, they, we used to, um, there was uh, a friend of mine who, whose family owned the farm had a pool table in this back room. And so we'd be in there shooting pool. And one day, Larry Mayhaw walks in. And he blocks the whole door, comes down there, and says, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're shooting pool, Mr. Mayhaw. You know? He says, well, you know, we give him this. So he shoots with us. And he takes all of our money, which at the time was something like maybe $2 a piece, <laughs> right? We're betting for quarters. And he's, he's a good. great <laughs> pool shot. And he looks at us, and he looks down at us, and he says, this is why you're not supposed to gamble. <laughs> then he puts the money back on. Oh, the no, table. really? Yeah, and he That's walks perfect. out. That's you know, it's a great story. It's a lesson. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, it was sort of, we had it interesting because I always had a lot of respect for him as part of our community. And actually, you know, my mom tells me that he was very helpful to her after my dad got injured, you know, and all of that stuff. But politically, 
um, we, we, we uh, weren't necessarily on the same side. And, and, and it's interesting, well, he was on our side. He was very close to uh, former Governor Ryoshi. And he obviously he supported the Governor Ryoshi. When I ran as the Lieutenant Governor, he supported both of us. But when I ran for Governor, you know, he supported everybody but me. <laughs> 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 so, you know, it's like, uh, you know, he had his own reasons for doing that. It would have been different if you won that pool game? Maybe, <laughs> maybe. You know, it was interesting, but it, it also had to do, it underscores the fact that in, uh, you know, in politics in Hawaii, it's not necessarily all about the label. I mean, uh, for example, in the primary election, he uh, supported the C. C Seftel uh, against my, this is my primary election for the governorship. Yeah. And uh, so did some other prominent Democrats who later became very friends with, like, uh, Dickie Wong, the then president of the Senate. And then when I came to the general election, I said, hey, you guys got to, you know. But my opponent in the general election was uh, Andy Anderson, who was a longtime Republican, but a very much, uh, uh, a, you know, a good guy. I, I uh, like Andy. Guy, yeah, sure, and a very sure. popular guy and very close friend to Larry and to Dickie again. So once again, we're on opposite sides of the fence, you yeah. know. But um, that had nothing to do with the fact that once the elections were over, he, he was a person I, I respected. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you stayed in touch, really, uh, with, with, you know, the outer islands, the neighbor islands, and the big island during your administration. Oh, yeah. In fact, I was very proud of being from the neighbor islands. And, you know, I, I was very proud. You know, we used to, uh, I had a political theory that our campaign was built coming from the neighbor islands inward to Oahu. And yeah. there was a kind of a theory, and if you're any aspiring politicians up there, I'll, I'll give them a little tidbit. Please. And that is that in the neighbor islands, it's still a kind of, uh, uh, there's still community-based uh, uh, influence that's going on. People move by families, they move by communities, they talk, they like each other, they know their neighbors. And so it's easier to get groups of people to commit to you. On Oahu, we live in a world that is constantly uh, disassociated, you know? And so here, people, a lot of people decide what they're gonna do politically at the very last minute. So what do you do? In the beginning of a campaign, you spend as much time as you can personally shaking every hand on the neighbor island and then save all the money you got to buy TV commercials for <laughs> Oahu, right? You no, know you can't reach them all in Oahu. No, you can't. <laughs> and, 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 and our linkages in Oahu, may, uh, you know, to, 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 to uh, set that uh, an approach up as community based is really artificial. Yeah. Here, we're, our communities may be our, our workplace, you know, our clubs, our associations, much more so than the fact that I have to drive in the traffic and go all the way out to Kapolei for the house that I can afford. Yeah. You see, that's not really uh, kind of community-based. Yeah, I have a theory I want to <coughs> throw at you and see what you think of it. I call it insular <coughs> drift. Okay. Okay, and I relate it <coughs> back to, uh, not that I was there at the time, but uh, there used to be a lot of ships that, that plied between the islands. Right, And you right. could get a, a, not a ferry so much as a ship and you could visit your family, right. you could stay right. in touch. You I, I, re I, re I remember those days, you know, I, I never actually took the ships, but we used to go down and see them. Yeah, sure. All the time. And not only, and they were between the islands, and also between uh, Hawaii and the mainland, yeah. you know, the, uh, what is the Lusitania? Uh, no, Lurleane. 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 And the Monterey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was crazy that, that was World War I. No, no, something bad happened. <laughs> I don't want to bring that up. But anyway, yeah, and, and, and it, it was, uh, I remember those days very much. Yeah, and you know, and uh, I think families had the possibility of, of coming together and there, were, there was a lot of uh, immediate family connection because a lot of people had moved in uh, right. after statehood, they moved in from the neighbor islands to Honolulu to make their, to make their lives well, here. And that was part of the political strategy as well. Yeah. Because if you start from the neighbor islands and you come in, then if you convince people in the neighbor islands because of their families living here, you already start making networks yeah. here. That, by the way, is, uh, was the political theory 
uh, that the Democratic Party built on. It wasn't just original with me. You know, it's just kind of it. But you're right. I, it was. Uh, yeah, well, what, I, what, I wanna, what I want to throw at you is that it was tighter then somehow, um, and it was easier to connect with your family somehow and with the people you knew in the neighbor islands. And um, I, I think in a funny way, my view of it is that we were, as a state, we were closer together, closer tied together. Then, you know, as years went by, maybe the family connections weren't as strong, the ferry, the, rather the boats went away. Um, the ferry. Were, the ferry went away. See, that was the good thing about the ferry. I, not, I'm not want to kill your train of thought, but yeah. the good thing on the ferry was kind of a reuniting. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And then the airfares, you know, and then Aloha went out of business, so we had a wine only, and the airfares immediately spiked. And now, you know, it costs almost three hundred dollars to make that trip. I know it's insane. And you know, you can't get there. In the old, in the old days, you you know take a um, a straw mat and an igloo. And go go for Plus, a day's you know, trip. in the old days, you, you know, I just I just went up to the Big Island, yeah. flew up in the morning, came back in the evening. Yeah. That never happened. Yeah. If you went up to the Big Island, if you had to catch a boat to go to the Big Island, yeah. even a plane, yeah, you know, it was a big deal. Yeah, you planned for it, you got ready for it, you you expected to stay. And where did you stay? I mean, people who lived on the Big Island and, or on the neighbor islands and came to Oahu. Expected to stay with their relatives. Sure, you know, talk story all talk weekend. Talk story, do all this <laughs> stuff. Now I fly up there. If we if we stay overnight, we're in the hotel. Yeah, you know, it's a different. Uh, different you're right. It's a different bond. So my 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 term that I apply to this is insular drift. That is, uh, in a sort of conceptual way, the islands have moved a little further apart for us, and we're just not as tight as we used to be. Do you agree with that? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, I think the, to, we, we, there is still, though, there is still a core of um, a bond of some kind that still exists so that people from Hawaii, and, and, that, and that bond, I think, manifests itself mo uh, best when we, we run into each other outside of Hawaii. Yeah, and all of true? a sudden, you know, you know the bond, you, yeah, you yeah. know the feeling, and you start to express things that are common to everybody. Yeah. But the, 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 the real uh, social bonding that used, to, that used to exist is much less so today. I think it's also reinforced by technology as yeah. well. I mean, you know, I sit now in my office, and the, the good thing about the email is instant communication. But the bad thing about it is I don't have to face the person I'm talking to. <laughs> you know, and, and I said this, I just went through a little incident with some uh, lawyers where I said, why don't you guys talk to each other? Because you know, you're writing these emails and all you're doing is accelerating the confrontation. And posturing and all and that. And posturing, yeah. because you don't have to actually deal with the person. Yeah. Uh, in the, back in the day that you were describing, you didn't have a choice you actually had to deal with your neighbor. And so it, 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 it manifests something. But still, though, it's, this is still a place where despite all of that and despite all, there is this underlying bond. You know, um, Bob Krause, who used to work for uh, the, the newspaper, sure. he wrote a great book, a yeah. fantastic book called The Island Way. And the, 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 what he postulated in the book was that people coming to Hawaii, whether they came, their ancestors came a thousand years ago, or whether the person himself or herself just came yesterday, the islands changed them. Isn't that and true? And it's, it's hard to define uh, that phenomenon except to describe it. And people start to become uh, part of something you know, without even realizing it sometimes. And actually, when I read that, I, it was a fascinating, uh, I really got, uh, you know, personally t taken with that. And then I started to talk to a lot of the um, Kupuna-type Hawaiians. And, and it was actually a Hawaiian belief, uh, that uh, Hawaiian value that the, uh, that the islands themselves own the person and not the other way around. Aren't you worried that maybe we're losing some oh, of am. that now? I am. Absolutely. Yeah. I Absolutely. You know, the one thing about being governor, 
uh, Ian, and seriously, I, I know we, we say what we do about politicians, and in many cases correctly so, you know, I mean, I'm not going to, you know. But on the other hand, when, when you're in the governor's seat, see, I never really appreciated what, actually what Quinn meant when he used to talk about how Hawaii was special. And later on, I obviously, because of my background in, in, as a Democrat, obviously learned that first from Jack Burns. I mean, it wasn't years ago until I learned that even Governor Quinn's book. So it didn't matter. But they used to always talk about the fabric of Hawaii. What made Hawaii special? And what made Hawaii special was the idea that somehow, some magical happened, and we all became locals. We all became locals. We were all in the same, um, uh, you know, same circumstances. The nature of uh, island life and the special nature of Hawaii. Right. I think it's a special nature of Hawaii, and it's, as you say, it's island life. I mean, on a continent, you don't have to face your neighbor. You can go someplace, go west, right, young right, man, right. go west. But here, there's only so many, so much resources. There's only so much people. And unless we get along, unless we are our best selves, then we can't have the kind of community that and we And you want. have to evaluate this if you are to preserve it. You have to, you have to know what that essence is if you want to you know, identify and preserve it and make it go forward. Oh, Otherwise, yeah. it is at risk. Well, I think it's at risk. I think we have to work at keeping it every day. Yeah. And I think, and, and people used to talk, talk to me about it. Governor, what you think the most important job of the governor of Hawaii is? And, and they would expect something about, you know, you got to build this, do that, pass this. And I would say that the most important thing that the responsibility of the governor of Hawaii and a mayor or any per person in, in leadership is the preservation of what is best about Hawaii. And what, we, what is best about Hawaii is this place that we can all call That's our That's great. I yeah. love that. Yeah. This is uh, John Waihe, former governor of the state of Hawaii. We are honored to have him on our show here on Community Matters. We'll be right back after this very short break. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Hi, I'm Chris Letham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Okay, we're back, we're live at a two o'clock rock. <laughs> John Waihe, former governor of the state of Hawaii. So, you know, Governor, I'm, I'm so interested in, um, you know, your rise to power. Okay. So, you know, you're on the big island, you get involved in the Democratic Party, it wasn't everybody getting involved, really. Um, the whole state was sort of going in that direction. Um, and, and somewhere along the line, uh, you know, the bug of, of politics, community service, it bites you. How did that work? Well, actually, um, you, you know, it actually starts on the mainland. You know, I, w I went to school in Michigan, and it, you can't, couldn't help in the late 60s and early 70s not to get caught up in the national movements, you know, the civil rights, the uh, even student power and the rest of it. And I actually uh, worked in the city in Michigan uh, as a um, 
as a community organizer. All right. That uh, and, and which is, by the way, where I met Jesse Jackson and all these types <laughs> of people. And, and 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 it occurred to me as I was working up there and actually doing pretty well at it that. Uh, if I wasn't careful, this that's where I'd end up. And I can't talk to myself, what I should do is, uh, you know, what you should do is go home. Go home and take some of this home. I wanted to come back to Hawaii. And, uh, you know, I was this coming out of college. I had this kind of da 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 And I r came back home, and the first thing I thought was, I know how to do everything you know <laughs> and uh, and the people taught me really quickly because uh, I, I i came back and i started working for model cities you know which was a federal uh community action type program and the first thing i learned was that the the, the people thought hey, man, who is this guy you know he <laughs> talk funny now you know, he, he thinks he has all these airs he thinks he's smart and i got placed in the right place but it was also, the 70s were a great time in Hawaii. It was a good time. The Democrats had, uh, had come into the power here after 50 years. Uh, their statehood was, had, had occurred. There was all of this energy going on. We were going to change for the better, all of this, and all through the 60s. When you get to the 70s, the young people and others are starting to see where maybe the promise the, the uh, what was being done wasn't the fulfillment of the promise, that they started to have doubts. Maybe we were going too fast with development. And, and so there were these uh, sort of um, protest movements going on and, and the like. Mirroring, mirroring protest movements on the mainland, because this was uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the time, right? Well, this was coming down. And, yeah. and by the way, what happened was um, Johnson, President Johnson, President Nixon, so this is right and left, right? Yeah. Both started these uh, social welfare programs, and the one common characteristic that they all had was this concept of citizen participation, beneficiary participation. People, community should decide their, uh, what, what happened to them uh, and, the, and their programs. Well, that's an easy concept to spill off into just plain old community organizing. Yeah. And so, and, uh, and, and Native Hawaiians, uh, the whole Native Hawaiian Renaissance, uh, it, it, on one, uh, one aspect of it started off of that. Because what people realized as they were involved in these federal programs was that there were programs in Hawaii set aside for Native Hawaiians, like Hawaiian Homes. And it wasn't successful and the beneficiaries didn't feel like they were the part of it. So shouldn't we do something about it? Shouldn't we do something? About it? And so all of that was, ha uh, was, uh, was happening. Now, just to let the people know. But this drew you in. You wanted oh, to be yeah, involved I, I, in the I wanted to be. I wanted to be part of it. It was part of my, uh, you know, but I never expected to be in politics. I actually wanted to be a lawyer. And, and do this thing. I, you know, when you grow up in the Hawaiian household and everybody's talking about this change, that change, the one thing that people were bemoaning constantly, my family and everyone, we, I wish we had a lawyer. So all of a sudden, the U, University of Hawaii Law School opens up, we, uh, we attended, we graduate. This is these, now it's not all about negative things, you know? It was about discovering music, it was discovering dance, it was discovering hokulea, and what that meant and, and how unifying that was. And actually the 70s was a very overall a supportive time. And it's, it's interesting because on the political spectrum, just to bring this all the way back to where we started, I was actually on the side of throwing out the radicals. You know, so Jack Burns, was the enemy, so to speak. You know, these guys with the big, these are the guys who don't know what they do. Why? Yeah, I'm a solid Democrat, pro-labor, pro-this, pro-that. <laughs> but these guys are, the, you know, we're going to overthrow. We will have a revolution. And I remember later on when I was governor and speaking to the Democratic Party uh, at their convention, and we are being protested 
because Democrats, you know, we don't feel good about ourselves unless we have a protest <laughs> around any of our meetings, you know. So you have all these protesters out there. And for, but for the speech, they all came indoors yeah. to pro let me know that they're going to hold these signs. They didn't like what I was doing. Well, my, my speech to them was, be careful. Be careful. You someday will be the establishment, just like me. And, you know, and that's the wonderful thing about our system. And, 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 and I believe in this 100%. Which is, by the way, as you know, is very, I'm, I'm sort of jumping around, but I, I do want to make this point about the need for revolution, you know, in every institution. And um, one of the things that I, I've said to people was one of the problems of politics today is that people sort of get anointed or mentored in. Now, I'm not knocking mentorship. I think that's important. But I do believe that the last 15 years or so is the last generation that we haven't had a revolution, a political revolution that's real within the institutions, you see. So now you look at the state legislature and the Democrats are, the young Democrats are, <laughs> have been there for 20 years. You know, I mean, how, how much of a revolution is that? Or if the new Democrats, it's because everybody helped them in. You know, in our time, we were waves of people coming in. You know, in 1974, uh, on their own, all of a sudden, you know, a Caetano, an Abercrombie, a Dickie Wong, and all these guys enter the legislature and Boom. With, with a mission, they wanted to with change a, with things. A, with a mission. It was a revolution. It was a re and then in '78 we get started, and we come in, and there is a revolution. Revolution for the agenda. <coughs> the young Republicans today, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> got caught in a blizzard in New York. So, <coughs> but the young Republicans today, are bright young people, bright young people. I, 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 I mean, but they're not taking advantage of this either. They, they think that the revolution starts against the Democrats. And the revolution really is an internal one first. In the Democrats. In the, no, within the Republican Party, just like the first revolution should be within the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. You need to change it. So when people don't have revolutions, what they do is a kind of monkey see, monkey do. The National Party does this, we do that. You know, that wasn't the way it happened in Hawaii before. Yeah, we looked at what was happening nationally. We wanted to apply it locally. But then the real challenge was, how do we do it here? How do we do it here? You, you were involved in that very kind of process. You were, um, you went to law school? In the first right. class, was right. it? Or the first class? Yeah, first, first, first class, class. wow. Yeah. And, and my recollection, you, you know, this is only sort of scuttlebutt, my recollection is that you organized a group of people who who were going to move forward and try to get into politics, well, and you wanted to establish a whole new a whole new way of looking at things, a, a new right agenda. out of your law class. Am I right? Right, and we, we in, in doing a new agenda. Yeah, you know, and and so here we are in in in, in um, well today, and every time this issue, should we have a new uh, constitutional convention comes up. Big question. And all of the, my friends who are, you know, today very well established in, in, the, in, in the establishment are, are, are you know, for, for good reasons from their perspective, opposed to it. They don't want to change. You know, we, we had all these amendments that we accomplished for Native Hawaiians. Well, don't touch it. If you have a convention, then uh, people are going to change That's it. That's an interesting barometer. Then, uh, you, yeah. and we haven't had one since 1978. Right. <laughs> and that's a problem. Yeah. See, so I'm always on the side of doing it because I, I think that every generation ought to have its shot at setting the agenda. I mean, you know, Amen I, to my that. job to, is to go down there and protect what I think needs protecting by arguing for it but we ought to have the ability to recreate it or change it uh, every, every 10 years. And that's least. what you did in 1978. Right. That must have been such an exciting time. Well, it, it People was. People came together with a new agenda. 
there were there were there, if you the timing was that there were all these proposals being floated on how to make government this and how to make and yet we sort of carved out a path that really set the agenda to what it is today you know whether it's the native rights whether it's protection of agriculture the water and what is interesting for people like myself who came um, didn't really know business is that we started to make alliances with people like Bill Patey and others and realize that they're not here trying to destroy Hawaii. They actually have as much at stake as we do in making this place work. You know, and as I said later on, when I became governor, then I really appreciated Jack Burns, what he was trying <laughs> to do. I really appreciated Bill Quinn. Yeah. You know, what he was trying to do. Yeah. Not necessarily, you know, it's not about agreement. It's about what your commitment is to making it better. Right. You see, if you and I can have survive, severe disagreement if we both know that our objective is to make it better. Yeah. And then, and then, we, then we can talk, you see? A positive state of mind, uh, a wish to do community service, a wish to serve the community, make, make it better. Well, I didn't think I was going to run, you know, at all. And so I like being behind the scenes and playing lawyers and organizing and putting the group together. And then I, I actually got talked into running. Uh, you know, when I went to work for my law firm, I love litigation. What year litigation. was this now? This is uh, like in 78, just okay. before, you know, the beginning of the Constitutional Convention. And uh, I remember working uh, for this labor law firm. We represented the unions, you know, and I was happy with this and I loved litigation. I, you know, I thought that was going to be my life. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, uh, oh, and my boss, my senior partner had called me in and says, well, you know, if you work for me, no more politicians in this firm, which I said, oh, great. You know, <laughs> but I'm going to dabble. Yeah, you can dabble, just no. But anyway, then one day they call me in and say, run for the convention. Why? Well, you know, da, 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 da. Uh, okay, so I run. And it's amazing because the first thing that I came in conflict with, with was the first group was my, was my clients, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, in any... Any institution like a convention or any legislative body, the, the really, the first thing that one, the people need to do is organize. And they had already selected their own candidate, and we were the Young Turks coming in, and we thought that what we were going to do was all about the rhetoric and what we posted on the walls and all of that <laughs> stuff. You know, hey. And then the first thing we get told is, wow, you know, um, we want you, would like you to support uh, this candidate. Who's the candidate? Well, we want you to support William Patey. I said, who's William Patey? <laughs> well, he's a plantation manager. <laughs> For what? I, what? <laughs> this is literally, literally the, the scenario. And I, and I say, what? And I said, are you asking me to support a plantation manager? My daddy will turn around in his grave. <laughs> I'm never going to do that. <laughs> so the first thing we start out doing is opposing all of this stuff. Okay. And then having to work it all back together. And that was the challenge. All in the, all in the mix of, of Yeah, and how do and you bring and... about, how do you bring about ideas and actually produce something? You see, people think that the only thing that you're going there for is to have a debate, and that's not true. You go to any convention, including the one going on, hopefully, to produce something. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't, then um, you wasted a lot of people's time. This turned time. out to be a very productive convention, didn't it? Well, it did, and they never had another one. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't they? I mean, well, we I think what that. happened was that, you know, it was sort of strange, because when we came out of the convention, a number of things happened. I mean, we really did shake up the legislature. And people, you know, and that was because the, the normal theory, the, the, when, you, when you talk to political scientists, the way con, uh, constitution should be very general and above and not, not. But constitutions also have, provide the public with an opportunity to create the agenda. 
And, 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 and most politicians and, si and people who like to talk about how it ought to be general and way up there, leave it to us to interpret it because it allows the existing institutions to set the agenda. But I, we looked at it as, wait a minute, we got 20, 30 years. What's important in this new Hawaii? What's important in a Hawaii um, <clears throat> that's now almost 18 years at that time from statehood? What is it? Well, what's important is the preservation of this, the doing of that, the mandate to do those things. Um, which is what the legislature then had to grapple with. And, uh, you know, I think it's time that uh, that happens again. That yeah. somebody else goes in and actually <coughs> realizes that this is not just about writing words. This is about political change and the opportunity to set the political let change. Me, let me throw a, one thought at you. We'll <coughs> take a break Excuse in a minute. <coughs> but, um, you know, if, if you like, for any, whatever your special interest is, if you like <coughs> the status quo, then you don't want a constitutional convention. You no. want to maintain the status quo. Um, if you're concerned about the status quo and you want to change it, then you want a constitutional convention. And as you said, every generation should well, have I its chance. That, I think there is a third ground, though, okay? And that is, I can, in fact, appreciate the status quo, but realize that the status quo, what makes it good, has to be reignited from time to time. Reignited. Yeah. I love Re that. Reignited. You know, yeah. and, and, and the way you reignite it, so even if you don't change anything, you reignite it by testing it. You reunite it by letting it be challenged and defending it. Yeah. And you see, the problem is people like this that want the status quo don't want to see it challenged. They don't want the, the they don't want to put the energy in. It's kind of almost like being lazy, you know. You, 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 if you so, our uh, our government works best when people uh, don't just accept it. Yeah. When they challenge it. And, and, and I think that that's what you need to do. I don't believe that we should change, uh, 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 we, if we're going to change anything, we change very few things in this particular constitution. But we should have the discussion. But we should have every paragraph challenged. Yeah. You know? Wow. Okay. <clears throat> Great. John Thank Waihe, you. former governor of the state of Hawaii. Wow. This is good stuff. And here in Community Matters, we're talking about uh, his life and times, his politics, and his successors, and his advice. We'll be right back. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island and a physician. I host a show weekly called Healthcare in Hawaii, where we talk about the most important issues in healthcare for our state, whether it's the dengue fever outbreak, the state of our public hospitals, how to find physicians and nurses for our patients, or really just the best things to do for our family's health. That's what you'll find on this show. I'll bring experts to your attention and we'll have a free-flowing dialogue. Thanks for joining us. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with John Waihe, former governor of the state of Hawaii. Honored to have him here on ThinkTech. Um, in this part of our program, I really would like to ask you how it was to be governor. <laughs> uh, you were the first Native Hawaiian governor. That was right. really remarkable. Yeah. Um, how you pulled it together, how you kept it together. What were your challenges? What were your successes? And what were your lessons? Well, I tell you, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's a, if you're going to be in politics, it's the best job. It's the best <laughs> job in the world. I mean, 50 states. If you're going to be governor anywhere, be governor in Hawaii. <laughs> uh, you know? And, and there's some reasons for that. Not the least of which, well, yeah, you know, not the least of which our people are much more uh, loving, <laughs> I would say, I guess, in general, than uh, elsewhere. I mean, e e people generally believe, even today, and as cynical as the society is getting, that these things belong to them. And, and, and in a sense, the, the capital reflects that. This is the one capital 
that if you're a politician, you can't go to your office without walking through the public. <laughs> so they, people think they own you, sure. which is good, which is good. And so it's a great place to be governor. Now, you, you, the, the, the one thing, one piece of it, maybe I'll start with a piece of advice. And, um, and this is going to sound really strange, but the one piece of advice I think uh, that is most critical is never fall in love with your accomplishments. Okay, and that's going to say, well, what do you mean by that? I'm proud of what I've done and, and many things. But you've got to realize that one of the problems with politics is that instead of dealing with an issue, we believe that once the, uh, something, that the one solution is successful, that it is, we have to keep it the same forever and forever. And that's not what made it successful to begin with. So today's challenges are really, in many respects, the same challenges I faced 20 years ago. And the real challenge, the real objective of a, of a vibrant po political system is to, to accept that and to face that challenge and find a solution for this generation and this time. Update. Yeah, update it, update, you know, exactly, just like they do in the computers, just like we do in technology. <laughs> updates, updates, updates. You yeah. never try to cling to your last update, yeah. you know? Yeah. We came, our party came out, Democratic Party, for example, came out of the plantation economies, right? So we loved it. We, we tried to preserve it. We did everything. Yeah, but we should have known along the way that cane burning affects people's health. So rather than try to make it a sacred cow, <laughs> we should have sort of figured out what would... How not to do it. How, yeah, <laughs> how, how, or how to do it better, yeah, and how yeah, to yeah. keep it. What would be the agriculture of the future? Yeah. You know? And, and so, yeah, we, we, I, I, you know, I'm proud of housing. I'm proud of what we did for housing. The villages of Kapule today, back then, was a cane field a cane field that wasn't growing cane. Yeah. The thing had, the industry had gone out. Fallow land. Fallow land. But the idea of a second city had been around forever, but why not, why aren't we doing it? Because I'm too crazy to realize that, uh, you know, you, you're just not going to do it. You can't go do it. So we did couple it. We did all of that. How do we make it better? How do we do it today? And you had some problems. I mean, I remember the plantations were closing in those years. Oh, yeah. They had were, to come up with some ways to, you know, keep people fed and keep so Keep people fed, generate houses. Now, we also had, in my day, you know, something that, uh, a challenge that, uh, you know, don't exist today. And that was money was being thrown at foreign money was being coming in here like crazy. How do we dampen that? How do we dampen that? Big one question. of the big, one of the that's you know Frank Fossey and I had to be on the same length on that. We had to go deal with Frank, you know, and I frankly I like the guy, but uh, you know he. How do you deal with it? It was exciting times, and w the one thing was never letting what you did before, uh, first of all, bind you to constantly doing the same thing, and second, uh, you know, put a lot. Just be willing to change. Be willing to just focus on what needs to be done. Let's take one last minute. I, I'm sorry we're out of time, and I want to come back and do this some more with you, <laughs> if you're willing. Um, is uh, the question of sovereignty? I guess sovereignty has really, you know, occupied a lot of the of the public uh, debate right. uh, since since you left office. It's increasingly so, um, and it's been around OHA, but it's also been you know outside of OHA. And there's various uh, narratives, various pathways being considered. Um, you know, you are kind of the example, if you will, of a very successful Native Hawaiian politician. You got into that business and really did a job on it and changed, and changed the state for that matter. Um, it was a great path and it was of great value to all of us. Um, the question now is though, uh, people seem fragmented. There are various narratives competing, lots of arguments going. What position do you take about that? Well, I think that first of all, I think, uh, 
you know, Reddin is coming on and saying we're going to talk about sovereignty, which has many aspects. Yeah. And and I would love to do a show. Yeah. In fact, tell your buddy Akina sometimes yeah. if he ever wants to all do this together. I will. We will. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I, I think that um, uh, I think the first thing that Hawaii is screaming for is leadership. You know. And the sovereignty movement, everything else. You bring things together. You need people who are willing to take a leadership. I don't know how much time we have, but you only know, a minute or so. Yeah, and so there were there are all different levels of, of sovereignty, including the fact that one of the most important sovereigns that need to be uh, discussed is the state of Hawaii. So whatever Native Hawaiians do in terms of their sovereignty has to be something that would be compatible with existing sovereignties. That, uh, and I, whether it was Kamehameha III when he uh, made his treaties, first international treaties, the first thing about sovereignty is the idea that it does not exist in a vacuum. So the real challenge is to see how it all fits. Now, we can argue forever about the foundation of one theory or another, and we don't have time here. but. I believed in sovereignty because I believed that it would make a better society. And if it doesn't, then why are we in it at all? You know? So my point being, sovereignty is a complex subject, but it is a subject that can work for all of us if we're willing to take the leadership to make it happen. All right. Okay. We have to talk more. <laughs> Thank it's you. John Rye, former governor of the state of Thank Hawaii. You. Thank you fun. so much, Governor. It's Thank been great you. talking with you. you. You'll come back, right? <laughs> yeah, I will. Thank <laughs> you. Aloha. Aloha.